Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Well, by now you've heard me talk a lot about superfoods and nutrient-dense foods packed with healthy polyphenols and antioxidants. But it's also a term that gets thrown at a lot of foods these days. So on today's episode, I'm going to help you separate the real superfoods from the phonies. Because lately I've been seeing all kinds of misinformation out there, misinformation that could be keeping you from truly feeling your healthiest. Today I'm going to share the biggest superfood myth, the one super oil. Actually, I'm going to tell you about two super oils that you probably never heard of and why some lectin-free foods may still be on the no-no list. You're not going to want to miss a second of this one. Okay, so let's start with an important question. What the heck is a superfood? Well, it's almost a superfood is in the eye of the beholder. And I think we really have to be cautious with the term superfood at all. In general, superfood should be nutrient dense and calorie sparse. In other words, you pack a lot of great stuff stuff into not a lot of caloric weight. Uh, for instance, the more polyphenols that something has, I consider the better the superfood it is. But there are some polyphenols in foods that have a lot of calories. So for instance, extra dark chocolate has a ton of polyphenols and cacao in and of itself, it's got some pretty great qualities as a superfood. But when you start adding sugar to that to make chocolate that you're probably going to eat, it may have an original ingredient of superfood, but it no longer qualifies as a superfood. Same way with coffee. There are so many great studies that the polyphenols in black coffee really qualifies a coffee bean, a coffee drink, black as one of the great superfoods that you can have. But if you then put several teaspoons of sugar and lots of junk and make a frappuccino out of it and ice it, it's now a 500 calorie sugar bomb that has nothing to do with the original ingredient. Plus, believe it or not, Coffee bean is the bean of a berry, and coffee fruit, the powder that we throw away for the most part, actually probably has far more polyphenols that are great for you than the coffee bean you're getting. Okay, so in general, nutrient dense, calorie poor is really one of the best ways to define a superfood. Okay, so now that you know what a superfood is, in my opinion, let's talk about some superfoods that you should probably never eat. Now, one of my favorites is goji berries. And any of you who have listened to me in the past know that one of the most momentous moments in my young career as a nutritionist was touting goji berries because they've got so many cool polyphenols and I was actually on the phone with Lauren Cordain, the Colorado State professor who truly is the father of the paleo diet. And I was telling him on how great goji berries were. And he said, what, don't you read the literature? And I said, well, you know I do, of course I do. He says, no, I'm gonna send you two papers uh, to show you what in the ding dong is wrong with goji berries. And these papers in humans actually showed that people consuming goji berries actually had more inflammation. So why? Well, it turns out that goji berries are from the United States. They're from North America. They were called the wolf berry, and they are a nightshade in the same family as tomatoes and eggplants and peppers. And I got news for you. You don't peel the skin off a of goji berry now, do you? So that's why goji berries are unfortunately not the superfood they're cracked up to be. Now there are some similar fruits that do qualify as a superfood. 
Right now, uh, in most parts of North America, mulberries are coming into season. Mulberries, I have some of the coolest polyphenols that you can possibly imagine. I prefer to, you, to use mulberry powder, but this is the time to eat mulberries. Soon in the fall, pomegranates will be available. And no, please don't drink pomegranate juice. It's pure sugar. But pomegranate and the oil in the seed has some of the greatest compounds that you will ever encounter. Much better choices. Wheatgrass. I see this all the time. Now, just remember that uh, wheatgrass, the idea that we should actually be consuming wheatgrass, got its start at the Hippocrates Institute in Florida. And I have uh, several patients who are, were former staff members there. And the idea originally was in um, people with cancer who were coming there, um, one of the ideas was to try and make cancer patients throw up. And the founder uh, noticed that when dogs want to vomit, they eat a lot of grass. And sure enough, uh, as anyone knows, it will make a dog vomit very effectively. So they got the idea that grass makes people vomit. And in fact, wheatgrass is a very powerful source of gluten and gluten-like proteins, as is barley grass, as is ryegrass. So please read the labels of your green drinks or your superfood drinks. And if you see the word green, wheatgrass or barley grass or ryegrass, please run the other way. I have so many patients on a gluten-free diet who do not know that there is gluten-like materials in wheatgrass and they have celiac disease and when we take their green drinks away from them with wheatgrass, that was the thing that flipped the switch and made them uh, no longer celiac. Want a better option? Moringa. Moringa is often called a superfood for very good reasons because moringa is edible, it has a high amount of protein in the leaves, and moringa is your new wheatgrass. And moringa is readily available, and look for it uh, wherever you can find it. One of my favorite, chia seeds. Chia seeds have lectins, I'm sorry folks. Chia seeds are from South America and Central America, and they do contain a lectin. Now the great news is there's something a whole lot better that works even better than chia seeds, and that is basil seeds, sweet basil seeds. They actually plump up faster, they don't have a lectin, and they have some fantastic health-promoting compounds in them, polyphenols, that chia seeds do not contain. And so if you're looking for the chia experience, please get yourself basil seeds. They're really cheap. You can get them uh, on Amazon. I shouldn't tell you that because now I probably won't be able to get any. But they are just fantastic for every place you would consider using chia seeds. How about quinoa? Now, quinoa also is a South American pseudo-grain. Uh, yes, the Incas used quinoa. They used it as a major grain fuel source, but the Incas did not just throw quinoa in a bucket of water and boil it. They soaked quinoa first, then they allowed it to rot. They fermented it. And if you've listened to me enough, fermentation is a very effective way of diminishing the lectin content of any food. Bacteria like to enjoy eating certain lectins, and so bacterial fermentation of quinoa made it then much less harmful to them. And you don't see the idea of fermentation on the package directions. Now there's a much better alternative to quinoa, and that's millet or sorghum. Neither of these have a hull, they don't have a lectin, and you can use them really interchangeably any place you'd use quinoa. So please stay away from those ancient superfoods. 
And while I'm on it, uh, ancient grains, I see this all the time. This is made of ancient grains. Well, number one, grains aren't very ancient in the human diet. We've only been eating grains for about 10,000 years. Rice has only been around for 8,000 years. And if you think that ancient grains are any more healthful, let me remind you that the ice man, the frozen man found in the northern Italian Alps, who is about 5,000 years old, who was riddled with arthritis and apparently a fairly young man, he had ancient grains in his pocket of his wrap. And I got news for you, that's where he got his arthritis. So there's nothing ancient about grains that make them any more healthy. They are not. So just when you see that buzzword made from ancient grains, uh, they're going to make you ancient sooner than you would want. Okay, so here's another myth I want to address. And this, this keeps coming up, uh, particularly in my patient population. And some people think that if a starchy food doesn't have lectins, and it appears on the yes list, then it's okay for them to eat and to eat in abandon. So let me explain why that's not true. So remember that a resistant starch or a starch is eventually going to turn into sugar. And how fast that starch becomes sugar is predicated really on how fast that you actually digest those starches, those long sugar molecules apart. So it's one thing to, let's say, take a taro root, uh, cassava, and cook a cassava and eat it whole. And it's quite another thing to grind that cassava into a fine flour and then use it as a flour. What you've done in the process of mechanically breaking those starches down is you've broken those starches into finer and finer and finer molecules so that you're able to digest those starches quickly as if they were sugar. And food companies have known this for a very long time. We didn't know they were doing it. So for instance, you can take whole grain wheat or whole grain oats and pulverize it with a Swiss roller mill and make it into ultra fine starches. After all, wheat's mostly starch and you will absorb that faster than if you actually ate straight sugar. And it will go into your bloodstream as glucose faster than if you ate straight sugar. So I see so many of my patients say, oh, oh look, you know, cassava chips, those are fine, or plantains, they're fine. And then they rush out and they buy cassava chips or plantain chips, and they're eating them by the bag full. And when they come in, number one, they've gained weight. Number two, their triglycerides are up. Remember, we convert these things first into triglycerides. And their insulin levels are up and their hemoglobin A1Cs are up. And they're shocked because they're eating safe foods. Well, they're not safe if you adulterate them into something that they originally weren't. So buyer beware. You're getting that plantain chip to dip it into guacamole as a way of getting guacamole into your mouth. You're getting that taro root chip not to eat a bag of taro root chips. You're getting it to get guacamole into your mouth not to eat these things. And I just see it all the time. I see people go on millet crazes and their triglycerides go up, their insulin goes up. So beware, 
Just because it's lectin free doesn't mean it's safe to eat in abundance. Okay, now there are some foods that really can be good for you if you eat them the right way. And first, let's talk about legumes or legumes. And these are the bean family. And as most of you know, I have nothing against beans as long as they are prepared correctly. And that is traditional cultures always soak their beans for at least a day. They change the water every four to six hours and poured out that water because soaking does reduce the lectin content. And then they tended to cook these beans a long time. There was always a pot of beans on the stove. And so prolonged cooking also decreases the lectin content. But the best way is to soak your beans and then pressure cook them. That's the quick and easy way to de-lectinize beans. Why are they a superfood? Well, it turns out that beans, lentils, actually have what are called polyamines, which, as I showed in the longevity paradox, really actually prolongs lifespan in all cultures and all studies. Also, you're gonna learn in the energy paradox that there are some very interesting phospholipids in beans that may be of real importance to you and your mitochondria. Now, there are plenty of other ways to get phospholipids in your diet, and stay tuned, we're gonna do a deep dive into phospholipids, but there are interesting phospholipids in beans that are worth your attention. Additionally, beans are loaded with prebiotics, prebiotic fiber. Remember, prebiotics are the sugar molecules that you and I can't digest, but our gut buddies think is the best thing that ever happened to them. And that's why that famous song that you all learned as a kid actually has some meaning. And you're actually gonna learn more about that in the energy paradox. And Beans, beans, that wonderful fruit, the more you eat, the more you toot. That's gas. The more you toot, the better you feel. So let's have beans with every meal. Pressure cook them, but don't have them with every meal because you don't need that much gas. Next, let's talk about the elephant in the room, and you know what I'm talking about, fruit. Uh, those of you who remember my first book, Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, one of the mnemonics was give fruit the boot. What's so bad about fruit? Isn't it nature's candy? Well, in fact, it is nature's candy, but nature's candy has been bred to make it even more candy. So blueberries now are the size of grapes and you can eat them by the handful because they are so sweet and they are loaded with sugar. As you're gonna learn in the energy paradox, the main sugar in fruit is fructose, aptly named. Fructose is so poisonous that your body has a complete system that takes fructose and doesn't let it much of it into your bloodstream as opposed to glucose which goes directly into your bloodstream the most of fructose goes to your liver and your liver remember is where things get detoxified and it goes to your liver because it's a toxin and it's turned into two primary substances one is triglycerides, which you have measured on your cholesterol test every time you have that measured, and uric acid. Uric acid is what causes gout, which causes kidney stones, and which raises blood pressure. So as you're gonna see in the energy paradox, the triglycerides that fructose are made into are a fat called palmitate or palmitic acid. And 
spoiler alert, the more palmitate running around in you, the less energy you're going to have. So fruit, if you're looking for energy, fruit is probably the worst choice for getting more energy. Now, are some fruits safer? Well, yeah, some fruits are safer. In the berry family, which are the safest, the safest are blackberries and raspberries and mulberries and pomegranate seeds, as I mentioned before. Try to stay away from healthy apples, for instance. They, can, they again, have been bred. Remember, honey crisp kind of tells you what that apple is all about. There weren't any honey crisp apples 30 years ago. Uh, wild berries are available. Wild blueberries are available frozen at many of your supermarkets. But the idea is not to use these things as a you know, huge pile of a snack. You can use them as a flavorant flavoring and salads, for instance. You can put a few, as we do in our blueberry pancakes made out of safe material, but you're not supposed to eat huge amounts of these things. Cherries, a few cherries is a wonderful thing, but when I see the people going out of Costco or Trader Joe's with gallon of cherries, and I talk to my patients and I see their blood work, and see their triglycerides going through the roof and seeing their blood sugars going through the roof, uh, I know where they've been and what they're eating. Finally, tomatoes. Remember, if something has a seed, it's a fruit. Even an avocado is a fruit, but it's pure fat and fiber and good fats to boot. Tomatoes are a nightshade. They contain lectins in the peels and seeds. So yes, you can have tomatoes if you peel and de-seed them. But here's the deal. I see so many people saying, well, tomatoes are so good for you because they have lycopene. And yeah, lycopene is a wonderful uh, substance that may protect your prostate, may be useful for other things, but you don't need to get lycopene just in tomatoes. My problem has been is when people, even with a de-seeding and peeling them, are eating a lot of tomatoes, I start seeing that their triglycerides are going up. I see that their hemoglobin A1C is going up. I see that their fasting glucose is going up. And I see that their fasting insulin is going up because these are still fruits. Here's a tip. Get yourself a tube of tomato paste from Italy. The peels and seeds have been removed, the tomatoes have been concentrated, and you can squeeze out a little tomato paste and you'll get all the benefits of the flavor you want in tomato, the color you want in tomato, with none of the downsides. So that's my tip for the day on tomatoes. Okay. There are also some foods that are great for some people and actually harmful for others. Uh, oxalates are getting a lot of talk. Oxalates certainly are very high in spinach. Spinach is number one for oxalates. They're also quite present in kale and chard. Some of the cruciferous vegetables are high in oxalates. Now, oxalates, if you are sensitive to oxalates, Oxalates can have an effect very similar to the effect that lectins have on people. Certain kidney stones are oxalate stones. And so if you've ever had a kidney stone, make sure you ask your doctor, was this a calcium oxalate store stone or was this a uric acid stone? And they'll tell you. So if it's a calcium oxalate, do be worried about your tolerance for oxalates. Uh, I've always felt that most people who think they're sensitive to oxalates are actually more sensitive to lectins, and when we get the major lectins out of their diet, most of my patients can tolerate the oxalate foods. But if you're one of them, absolutely. There's no human need for spinach, kale, and chard. There really isn't. Uh, 
I happen to think they're great for you. Do remember, I've talked about this before, there is a lectin in spinach that some people do react to, so just beware. Okay, seaweed. Seaweed is everywhere. Everybody talks about how great seaweed is for you. Now, seaweed is incredibly popular in Japan, and there's some fascinating studies that show the Japanese, through millennia, have acquired a microbiome that can digest seaweed and actually digest it. Uh, a quick primer. Uh, we, all animals, have no ability to digest the cell wall of a plant. The cellulose in a cell wall of a plant is undigestible by any animal. In fact, that's why all animals have bacteria in their gut to do the digestion of plants for them. Even termites cannot digest wood. Their little microbiome in that little termite does all the work. One of the interesting things that I subscribe to in evolutionary theory is the reason you and I have a much smaller intestine than a gorilla or a chimpanzee is not because we started eating meat. It's because we discovered fire. And fire, believe it or not, cooking breaks down the cell walls of plants. For instance, you could eat all the raw sweet potato in the world and you're not actually going to digest much of it because it's indigestible. But if you cook a sweet potato, you actually digest it very quickly and easily. And in fact, there's a lot of sugar in a sweet potato, as you'll learn in the energy paradox. So, the Japanese acquired bacteria by eating a lot of raw fish from the fish guts that had bacteria that digested seaweed. And it's been shown that, in fact, Japanese have bacteria that can digest seaweed, but it's also been shown that unless you were born and raised in Japan or lived there for a considerable part of your life, you don't have bacteria that can digest the cell wall of seaweed, and so it's just they're not there for you. Sorry about that. Okay, here's what you've been waiting for, my top five, maybe six superfoods. I can't tell you how much I think everybody should be eating mushrooms, should be taking mushroom tonics, should be having mushroom capsules. You've heard me go on and on about this. And something that you're going to learn in the energy paradox is one of the reasons that you have to eat mushrooms that you probably didn't know is that they contain melanin and melatonin. And no, they're not going to put you to sleep. We'll leave it at that. If you're going to eat fish, please stick to small fish like sardines, like anchovies. One of the most studied super long groups in the world, the Acciarolis in Italy, south of Naples, and I've had the pleasure of visiting uh, their little city and studying them. They eat anchovies, little sardines, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and they get all of their omega-3 fats, DHA primarily and EPA, by eating sardines. Plus, fun fact, they get bioavailable calcium in those little tiny bones. And so, if ladies, if you want to get your calcium and you want to support your brain health, have a few sardines. Okay, as you know, in the plant paradox, uh, I told you about perilla oil. Perilla oil is the most frequently used oil in Korea and parts of China. Perilla oil is a fascinating oil that has a lot of alpha linoleic acid, which is a short chain omega-3 fat. It's also a very unique source of rosmarinic acid which really supports brain power. We could go on and on about the benefits of perilla oil, but I'll refer you to a study in humans 
which was called the Lion Heart Diet or the Lyon Heart Diet, L-Y-O-N, but most from Lyon, France, but most people pronounce it lion. Uh, there, that diet in humans who had a heart attack, they were put on one of two diets. One was the Mediterranean diet in which their diet was supplemented with a margarine that was made with alpha linoleic acid, the same fat that's in perilla oil. The other group was given the American Heart Association low fat diet. It was a five year study. The study was stopped after three years because the Mediterranean diet group that was supplemented with alpha linoleic acid, margarine, actually had so few heart attacks, subsequent heart attacks, compared to the American Heart Association diet that it was unethical to continue the study. Now, most of the people continued on that study and they found that, in fact, the one difference of any blood marker between the two groups was the amount of alpha linoleic acid in their blood. That was the only difference in the outcomes between the two groups. So, that's why I'm a fan of perilla oil. Now, it's hard to get, so don't rush out and try to find it. I got a great alternative for you, sesame oil particularly regular sesame oil, not the roasted or toasted sesame oil. There's some fascinating things you'll learn in the energy paradox that sesame oil, the components of sesame oil, will actually block the effect of lipopolysaccharides, LPSs, those little pieces of shit, that cause all the problems in you from causing a problem. So please enjoy sesame seeds. Please enjoy sesame oil. It's probably one of the superfoods that doesn't get enough attention. Oh, and by the way, sesame oil does contain omega-6 fats, linoleic acid, and those actually block some of the effects of inflammation. Superfood next is prebiotic fiber. The more prebiotic fiber, soluble fiber I can get into your diet, the better. My favorite vegetables in this category are the chicory family. Most grocery stores will at least have radicchio, what many people call that Italian red lettuce, it looks like a dense red and white uh, small head of cabbage. One of the best sources of inulin that you can find. All the other chicory family, Belgian endive is really available. It's another chicory. Use that as a dipping chip for your guacamole. Now I'm gonna tell you about a nut that I'm also very fond of that doesn't get its due, and that's pine nuts. Yeah, pine nuts come from pine cones. There was some fascinating research looking at cultures who ate squirrels that lived in pine forests. And they found that people who had a diet of squirrels as part of their diet not only lived longer, but were thinner than people who didn't eat squirrels that lived in pine forests. And that prompted a great deal of research looking at what the heck was in pine nuts that might have this effect. And so pine nuts actually have been used and pine nut oil has been used to promote weight loss and to promote longevity. So here's the good news. You can even get big bags of organic pine nuts at Costco. Uh, I shouldn't have told you that either because now I won't be able to get any. But this is something you should consider adding a small handful to your regimen every day. And if you don't like the taste, it's in pesto. And believe it or not, the pesto at Costco is pretty doggone good. And it may be that all those pesto-eating Italians, basil and pine nuts and Parmesan cheese and olive oil, 
pesto may be one of the greatest superfoods or combination of superfoods you should have in your diet at least on a weekly basis. Lastly, another nut that many of you haven't heard of, but if you've been watching the podcast, you know it, Baruca nuts. So a Baruca nut looks and almost tastes like uh, a beer nut, those big brown peanuts that you sometimes associate with drinking beer in bars. So these have huge amounts of polyphenols. They have the most protein of any nut. They have very beneficial fats. And if you eat and buy Baruca nuts, you will actually be helping indigenous people in Brazil to actually eke out a living. Uh, and if you haven't watched the Baruca Nut podcast, please watch it or listen to it. It's fascinating how these came about. Uh, I have Baruca Nuts uh, every day. Okay, so that's it. The superfood myths, what they are, what they aren't how to get them in your diet, and I really appreciate you asking all these questions because I'm here for giving you the best answers I have. And just remember, when I learned something uh, that surprised me, that I thought I knew, uh, you're gonna be hopefully the first to find out, uh, besides my wife, Penny. Okay, it's time for the audience question. Today's question comes from E. Shapiro on the drgundry.com blog, who asks, are squashes and pumpkins okay if, number one, no seeds or skin are eaten, and two, they are pressure cooked, and three, they are in season and local? This is a great question, and the answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, they're okay if no seeds or skin are eaten, uh, two, they're pressure cooked, and they are in season and local. Uh, but here's the proviso. These are fruits. Any vegetable with seeds is not a vegetable. It is a fruit. Yes, I know we call them vegetables. That they're not. Just like a tomato is not a vegetable. It's a fruit. Fruits have sugar. Fruits have fructose. And so I have a great number of patients who have pre-diabetes, who have type 2 diabetes, who have, are type 1 diabetics, and who have elevated insulin levels, particularly the type 2s and the pre-diabetics. And these still act, when people eat these, and they do, as if they were actually eating fruit. So if you're part of the 80% of Americans who are pre-diabetic or diabetic, that's 80% of Americans with an elevated insulin level, please, 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 there is no need for these fruits in your diet. Yeah, they may be delicious. Yeah, I like pumpkin pie as much as anybody. But these are certainly not essential for your health, but more importantly, they may, under the guise of a healthy food or even a superfood, may actually be hurting your health. And I recently you know, spoke with Dr. Dale Bredesen, my good friend, who wrote The End of Alzheimer's, and I'm gonna plug his upcoming book, The End of Alzheimer's Program. And he, like me, warns against these high sugar containing vegetables as really something we all want to avoid in our diet. Sorry about that, but it's, it's, it's true. Okay, uh, finally, it's time for the review of the week. This week's review of the week comes from Thomas Nofziger on YouTube. I've been involved with the study of biology and nutritional science with sports nutrition formulation, mitochondrial research, bioenergetics, and individual nutritional consultation. In all that time, I've not come across anyone as impressive, researched, generous, experienced, and articulate 
as Stephen Gundry. Hmm. The longevity paradox is a gem of gems. Same for the plant paradox. I'm about to read the former for a second time. Inside is information that ought to be memorized and further researched. Tomas, the check is on the way. Thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, high praise indeed. And thanks. A lot of years of research go into this and I don't put anything into these lightly. And thanks for recognizing the work I'm doing because I'm Dr. Gundry and I'm always looking out for you and you, Thomas. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.